All right. Uh, I see a few people said um, they are able to see and hear okay. It looks like technical difficulties are getting worked out. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for joining us. And again, like in that video, we are tonight preparing our hearts, preparing our hearts uh, for this season of Lent. Uh, so let us go forward. Uh, again, welcome to everybody. Uh, I will just share tonight, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've been working a lot on the building at Grace Mountain. Uh, and tonight, uh, the contractor, he called me and he said, we've got a bit of an issue. Uh, we're not getting any heat in any of the rooms that the boiler heats. Uh, he's been working on that. And we think uh, one of the valves or something uh, quit working. So we were trying to restore heat in the uh, kids' room upstairs, in the kids' church room, and now we don't have any heat in most of the building. Uh, so we actually, Chuck is down there right now, our maintenance guy, Chuck Haynes, is down there, and we've got a boiler specialist working with him. Uh, so tonight for our prayers, uh, don't usually pray for buildings, but we're going to pray for Chuck uh, and just that the heat would be on because we're a little concerned the pipes might freeze tonight. Uh, so uh, let's just go ahead. I know we had an opening prayer already, but uh, let's just go ahead and pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we just again thank you for this evening. We thank you for Ash Wednesday. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. Uh, we pray, too, for Chuck and uh, the technician, uh, Lord, that you would just uh, help them to problem solve uh, for our boilers so that we don't have major damages tonight. Uh, Lord, we know that... Uh, our building is your building. Uh, it's your church. And it's really by your grace that it's there. Uh, we just ask that you would just watch over uh, all these repairs tonight. Watch over all those who are driving, especially tonight. Bring people uh, to their homes safely. Uh, we pray, too, for our Christian brothers and sisters across this world who right at this moment are coming together to celebrate Ash Wednesday. Uh, Lord, that you would just work in hearts tonight and draw people closer to you. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with a reading. Uh, we're going to read from Psalm 51, uh, verses 1 through 12. Uh, feel free, uh, you're at home, uh, just to read along with me as, as we read this. Again, this is Psalm 51, uh, 1 through 12. And it's really a psalm of confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Uh, now we're going to uh, have a little time of worship. Uh, I've got a, a music uh, worship video, uh, and for this, I know sometimes it feels awkward if you're at home, uh, maybe with just a family member or just by yourself, maybe with a a pet, uh, maybe you don't want to sing, or maybe you feel comfortable singing. Uh, honestly, it's a great time to just blurt it out. Uh, nobody can hear you, uh, but or if you don't if you don't want to sing, I would just invite you to spend this time just reflecting, reflecting on that psalm we just read to create a clean heart in each and every one of us, a pure heart. 
to cleanse us from our sins. Just reflect on that cross. Reflect on our Savior, Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. continue with our next reading from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. This is one of the three gospel accounts of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, 
Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Tonight is Ash Wednesday. It is Ash Wednesday. So the question is, if you've never experienced an Ash Wednesday, or perhaps maybe you have, but it's been so long, the question then is, what does that mean? What does it mean? What is Ash Wednesday? Well, this evening, I want to spend a few minutes just exploring what this day, Ash Wednesday, is all about. And this isn't going to be an exhaustive history of all things Ash Wednesday, but hopefully we'll cover a few of the basics. Ash Wednesday, as you see on the slide there, is the beginning of Lent. So then that brings the question, what is Lent? Well, Lent comes from an old English word, uh, which means spring or springtime. And it usually represents the month of March, which is usually the month that most of Lent takes place. Lent is a 40-day period that begins today and goes until the Saturday before Easter, what is also known as Holy Saturday. Lent is actually, usually, depending on how you count it, 46 days long, but you don't count the Sundays, so the six Sundays that fall in between now and Holy Saturday. We don't count those, and that's how we get the 40 days. Lent usually comes after the day known as Strove Tuesday or Fat Tuesday, or if you're French or live in New Orleans, also known as what? Mardi Gras. That's right. Lent is a time of remembrance and preparation. It is when we remember what Jesus did for all of us by dying on the cross on Good Friday and then coming back to life on Easter Sunday. So why 40 days? Lent lasts for 40 days because that helps us to remember the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, which as we just read in the book of Matthew is also recorded in three out of the four gospels. We remember how Jesus was led into the wilderness and for 40 days he fasted, not eating. And in his weakness, in his exhaustion, in his hunger, he was tempted by the devil, Satan, three times. But each time, he refused him. This observance of 40 days of remembering Jesus before Easter was practiced in the early church. But it wasn't formalized specifically as the time of Lent until about the year 325 by what was called the Council of Nicaea. The terms Lent and Ash Wednesday are not found in Scripture, but they follow practices that were part of the early church. We don't know exactly when the first Ash Wednesday service was practiced, but most likely it was sometime in the 6th century and originated by the Roman Catholic Church. Some early church records show that in the early Ash Wednesday service, during 40 days until Easter, or, or excuse me, before Ash Wednesday service began, the 40 days before Easter, followers of Jesus would often sprinkle their heads with ash and then separate themselves from others until Monday, Thursday, which is the Thursday before Easter. In a way, you could say they were practicing an early form of social distancing. The sprinkling of ash over the heads was the more common practice at Ash Wednesday when it originated until sometime in the Middle Ages. Then it was replaced by marking the forehead with ash in the shape of a cross, a practice known as the imposition of ashes. I was just remembering uh, how back in uh, 2020, uh, when we were all under quarantine and doing lots of isolation, uh, many churches in trying to do Ash Wednesday uh, actually brought back the practice of sprinkling the ash over people's heads as opposed to touching 
uh, the, the forehead with ash. Uh, it was a way to kind of do social distancing. In fact, a number of churches, uh, especially Roman Catholic churches, uh, they would do these sprinklings uh, in a large parking lot where people could drive by, kind of stick their heads out the window, and the priest then would sprinkle ash on them. I don't know if there were any records of ash ending up in anyone's eyes, uh, but if there was any wind, it was probably a likely event. Uh, if you have been to an Ash Wednesday service, you probably didn't have ash sprinkled on your forehead, but you had what we just mentioned, the imposition of ashes, uh, where an, a cross uh, made of ashes was drawn onto your forehead. Then the question might be, where do they get the ashes? Where do churches get these ashes that they're sprinkling or they're marking onto people's foreheads? Well, in many churches, the tradition is the ashes come from taking the palm branches that are used on Palm Sunday and then burning them. There's a lot of significance to burning these palms. We remember how the people lined the streets of Jerusalem cheering Jesus as the great king thinking he had come to overthrow the Romans and reestablish Jerusalem as a great kingdom. But instead of overthrowing the Romans and establishing an earthly kingdom, Jesus had come to overthrow sin and establish a much different kingdom. These ashes from the burned palms are then mixed with water or anointing oil to make an ashy paste, which the pastor or the priest will simply dip dip his finger into the water and then put the ash onto the finger and then put them on someone's forehead. Licking your finger and putting them into the ash is not advised. Now, growing up as the son of a Lutheran pastor, I know often that the ash we use for Ash Wednesday services at our churches uh, actually usually came from our wood stove at our house or my dad's burn pile where he burned numerous wooden uh, objects. But that's just a little behind the scenes secret for all of you. The other part about Lent that we often hear about is fasting or giving something up for Lent. Traditionally, Ash Wednesday includes a day of fasting or at least eating very small meals. In the ancient Roman Catholic Church, fasting on Ash Wednesday was a pretty strict practice. Roman Catholics were encouraged to abstain from eating anything until after sunset. In more modern times, this changed to be a fast on dairy products, on, on fasting on meat, on fish, on wine and eggs. Historically, there would be some type of fast during the entire 40 days of Lent, with church members giving up various foods and other luxuries. In the Eastern Christian Church, these type of fasts are still widely practiced. I've mentioned before that I grew up in Mount Angel, Oregon, and at the school that I attended, Monitor Grade School, a school of uh, kindergarten through eighth grade of just over 100 students, we had a number of students who were Russian old believers. Uh, they were part of the Russian Orthodox Church, and I remember that during the time of Lent, our little school had to offer an additional beverage besides the free school milk that we offered. Uh, we would have to offer juice. And the reason for that is because all the kids that were Russian old believers, they had to abstain from dairy for the 40 days during Lent. And so they couldn't have milk, they had to have juice. This is also why for many families, the day before Ash Wednesday, that day known as Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras, usually included a big meal and often used pancakes. They would use pancakes because pancakes would help the family use up all the milk, all the butter, all the eggs that would usually go to waste during Lent. Today, people like to give things up for Lent as a type of fast to help them remember Jesus's suffering. These can be Things like foods they enjoy, uh, sugary foods, soda, uh, decadent desserts. They might be giving up something else like watching TV or using social media. I know many people, they take a Facebook fast during Lent. Now, whether you decide to give up something for Lent is entirely up to you. Just remember, if you choose to give up something, 
It's about remembering what Jesus did, giving his life for us on the cross. Our giving up something doesn't somehow make us better people or better Christians. If we give something up for Lent, we should choose to do it with the right perspective and the right heart, focusing on Christ and not on our own actions. Whether you want to give up something for Lent is entirely up to you. I would encourage you, whether you choose to give something up or not, that you would use Lent to spend more time in God's Word. Commit to reading more of your Bible, perhaps reading through the Gospels. Also, please refrain from announcing that you are giving up something that you don't normally do. Like this year for Lent, I'm giving up smoking when you have never smoked a cigarette in your life. Or you say, I'm giving up shellfish this year for Lent, when in fact you're allergic to them. Let's move on to talk about one of the main aspects, the physical, visual aspects of tonight, and that is ash. The question then is, why ashes? Why ashes? Why the sprinkling of ashes, the imposition of ashes? What's the deal with using ashes anyway? Well, to help us better understand why we use ashes, I think we need to take a look at a few scripture readings. And the first one is from Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. This reading comes right after Adam and Eve have fallen into sin. They have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God told them not to eat from. Sin has now entered the world, and there will be consequences. The serpent, who is actually Satan, who tempts them, receives consequences. The woman, Eve, receives consequences. The man, Adam, receives consequences. In giving Adam, and ultimately all humans, a consequence for this disobedient action, God says in verse 19, By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will turn. Perhaps you've seen that passage before, but I especially want you to focus on that very last part. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. What is God saying in that verse? Well, in Genesis 2, it tells us that God formed the man using what? Dust from the ground. So one day, the man, the woman, one day we will all die and our bodies will begin to decompose. And what will we return to? Dust. The ash is a sign of our dusty inheritance and our dusty future. We all share this dusty inheritance to Adam, and ultimately, we all share the dusty future of death. We use the ash on Ash Wednesday to remember the frailty of our lives. No matter what we accumulate on this earth, no matter how big and grand our homes, our bank accounts can be, no matter how many rewards and accolades and praises we receive, in the end, we all become dust. This remembrance of our frailty and ultimately our death is why on Ash Wednesday, the pastor or the priest will mark a person with ash and say words very similar to Genesis 3, reminding the person of their dusty origin and their dusty future. Another reason we use ashes is that ash is a sign of repentance and mourning. Throughout the Old Testament, you might remember people putting on sackcloth, sitting in ash, and dumping heaps of ash onto their bodies. If we take a look at a passage from the book of Job, you will see this in practice. This is Job 42, verse 6. This is Job speaking. Therefore, 
I despise myself and repent in what? Dust and ashes. When faced with the awesome power and purpose of God, in mourning, Job puts on sackcloth and he lies in ashes. Now look at the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel, in deep grief, puts on sackcloth, which, by the way, sack, sackcloth was made from the coarse and rough material that was used to make sacks, not comfortable at all. Nobody put on a pair of sackcloth sweatpants and just lounged around the house. It was scratchy, it was itchy, and it was very uncomfortable to wear. Wearing sackcloth and covered in ashes were a sign of great grief, of sorrow and repentance. It was an outward display of what the inward heart was feeling. It was a way to express to God, I am overcome with grief and I am sorry for my sins. The ashes used on Ash Wednesday are marking us as sinners in need of repentance. We receive the ashes on our head and we acknowledge that we are sinful. We acknowledge that we have hurt other people. We have let people down. We have sinned against people in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. And ultimately, we have sinned against God. We say, here I am, Lord. I am in grief for my sins, my failures, my mistakes. I am sorry for what I have done to you and to your people. I sincerely repent of the hurts that I have caused. I repent for my selfish actions, my falls into temptations, my many shortcomings. God, I am sorry. Finally, we use ash today because it reminds us of our overwhelming need for Jesus. We bring our sins and our repentance. And we know that even if we wear the nastiest, itchiest sackcloth, if we dump ourselves covered in ash, no matter how much discomfort we might have, or even how good we try to live our lives to be, no matter how many things we give up for Lent, that nothing we do can bring forgiveness for ourselves. We might give up every single luxury that we hold dear for these next 40 days. We might deny ourselves all matters of pleasure. And we promise God for the next 40 days, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to do the impossible. I'm going to not allow myself to enjoy anything. I won't eat sugar. I won't use social media. I won't go on screens. I give. I will give up high-speed internet and only use dial-up modem for the next 40 days. Friends, none of that will earn us forgiveness. No. Forgiveness is only found through Jesus. We receive the mark of ash, reminding us that Jesus died for us. Reminding us that Jesus took our sins upon that cross and gave his life so that you and I could have forgiveness and salvation. We did nothing to deserve this gift. We did nothing to earn it. Jesus did it for us. That mark of ash on our head reminds us that we are more than just a repentant sinner. That you are redeemed, you are justified, and you are a forgiven child of God. Yes, you came from dust, and one day your body will decay, and you will be dust again. But you are so much more than dust. You are a child of God. 
you are loved and you have been saved by Jesus. That ashy mark reminds you that you can take off the sackcloth, that you can get out of the ash pile because you are a child of our Savior. You are a part of the kingdom of Jesus. In the ancient church, people would receive the ashy cross on their forehead on Ash Wednesday, and then they wouldn't wash it off for the entire 40 days of Lent. For 40 days, they would proudly bear that mark of the cross on their foreheads. Well, in our world of showers, facial cleansers, and soap, keeping an ash on your forehead isn't very practical and probably not even possible. But the truth is that each of you has a permanent cross of ash on your foreheads. It's a permanent mark that Jesus has given to you. It's a mark that says, this is who I am. I am a forgiven sinner through Jesus. Do you feel that mark on you tonight? Do you know that it's there? Do you know that when you confess your sins and you ask Jesus to be your savior, that you have received the permanent cross of ash on your life? It's there. I know sometimes it can be hard to see it through our struggles, our issues, our shame, our guilt. But friends, it's there. Jesus has put that mark on you, and that's who you are. You are his, and nothing can take that away. No matter what happens, no matter how bad this world gets, your identity in Jesus cannot be taken away. It cannot be scrubbed away. You are his. Wear that mark of Christ with pride. Let it be everywhere in your life. Let the world know through your words and your actions that you are a child of the king, that you bear the mark of the savior of the world, that he is your savior, he is your redeemer, and nothing can take away the salvation, the forgiveness, and the promise that you have received. You are so much more than dust. You are a child of God. You are saved by Christ. Amen. We're going to do one more song this evening. Uh, this song is actually uh, composed uh, and um, performed by a local pastor here, Glenn Packiam. Uh, Glenn Packiam is the pastor of New Life Downtown. Uh, some of you I know actually know Glenn, uh, Pastor Glenn. Uh, he's a very uh, talented musician, um, and he wrote a song about confession. Um, and so again, if you want to sing along, uh, please do so, or just take this time, close your eyes, and use this as a personal time of confession. Uh, perhaps confessing to God things that are heavy on your heart. Uh, perhaps things that are just holding you down tonight. Uh, just a burden that is on your shoulders. Perhaps it's the burden of family members that you know who are struggling. Uh, perhaps someone that you know uh, who's so far from Jesus tonight. Uh, perhaps someone who's angry, someone who's bitter, someone who just feels overwhelmed or consumed by grief. Let's use this time as a time of confession. So we'll uh, sing along with the song. We'll listen to the song. And then once the song is done, I'll lead us in a prayer of confession. And I'm going to invite you during that time of praying uh, that you would just pray, that you would just pray silently, that uh, if you want to pray out loud, uh, that you would just pray your prayer of, of confession tonight too. Almighty God, we confess our sin. What we have done, what we have left undone. We have not
our prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are sinners. We confess, Lord, that we have made many mistakes, that we are flawed, that we have so many faults. Lord, you know all the ways we have wronged others and we have wronged you. Speaking for myself, Lord, I know how many times I have fallen so far short of what you need me to be. And I confess, Lord, we confess our sins to you. Perhaps sins that no one else knows but you, Lord. Things that are on our hearts. Perhaps things that were done to us that were so horrible. Things that were said that caused us to resent and hold grudges and bitterness. Perhaps people who didn't show up in our time of need, which caused us to be distant, which caused us to isolate from others. Lord, we confess so many sins to you. We give them to you. We confess, Lord, that we have not been the person that you have called us to be. We have not been the parent that we wanted to be. We were not the spouse we always should have been. We were not the friend that we needed to be. Lord, we know that we are flawed, that we have failed. And we give you these mistakes. We give you these failures. We give them to you, Lord. And we lay them at the foot of the cross. We lay them at the foot of the cross in our confession. In our weakness, and our frailty, we give them to you. And what do we receive? What do we receive for our iniquities, our trespasses, our falls into temptation? What do we receive for the garbage 
that we have done in this life, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your son, Jesus. As we stare up that cross, we see the blood stains where they pierced his hands and his feet. We see that our Savior has died for these sins and all the sins of the world. He has died for our failures, our mistakes. He has died for our garbage. And he has willingly taken it upon himself. Because you love us. You love us so much that you sent your son Jesus for each and every one of us. Each of us here tonight, Lord. We are your children. And as we confess our sins, we receive what is known as absolution. That is the forgiveness of our sins, not because we are such great people, but because you are such a great God who has sent such a great Savior for each of us. We receive that forgiveness, that forgiveness that we don't deserve, but you so generously give to each and every one of us through the blood, through the crucifixion, the death of your son, Jesus. We receive that forgiveness. And Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful to you. And all we can say is thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And now if you're with someone else in the room and you've been following along, uh, I'd like you to do something a little different. Um, or if you're by yourself, I want you to, if you're with someone else, just take your finger and put your hand on someone else's forehead and just trace an outline of a cross. If you're by yourself, just do it on your very for your own forehead. And as you trace that onto someone else or you put it on yourself, I want you to say those words that are on the screen. These are the words that if we were at an Ash Wednesday service, a pastor or a priest would say to you as they put that ash and that ashy cross on your forehead. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So are we without Jesus. Friends, that concludes our Ash Wednesday service for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, whether this has been your uh, 50th Ash Wednesday or uh, your very uh, first, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, ask, Lord, that uh, we would just walk in your way uh, and that this would just be the beginning of 40 days to draw closer to you. So thank you so much uh, for those of you uh, that are able. Uh, hopefully we'll see you on Sunday at service. Uh, for those that don't come to Grace Mountain, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, just blessings on, on the rest of your evening. Uh, please stay safe if you have to get anywhere. And just thank you again. Thank you for just making this time tonight. And if you have any questions uh, or would like to know more about Ash Wednesday, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, let's end with this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Have a great evening. God bless you.